Hi everyone, my name is Erin Adair Hodges. I am a poet and professor of creative writing at the University of Central Missouri, where I'm also the co-editor of the literary journal Pleiades. But before that, I lived in New Mexico. I was born in New Mexico, raised in New Mexico, and lived there for most of my adult life. And in 2016, Rebecca Aronson and I, um, after a couple years of talking about doing something like this, we started a reading series. Um, but we wanted it to be more than just a reading series because there's a great spoken word community in Albuquerque. But we also wanted to, you know, go see and listen to um, other kinds of writers. And we decided to create that space where spoken word and prose writers and playwriters and poets and, and whoever can come together. But as um, people who are also working full time, teaching five classes a semester and parenting young boys, we also wanted it to be a night out, right? To not just pay for a babysitter to go to a poetry reading, but for there to be music and wine and food and laughter. And so we started Bad Mouth. And the first event was at the Tanex, run by the incomparable Maria Erin Jones. Um, and after that, Bad Mouth went to Tortuga Gallery and Q Staff. Hey, Rich and Sandy. Um, so many Albuquerque creatives who make things like this possible. And when I abandoned Rebecca to come to the Midwest, she kept on going. Um, but bad mouth means a lot to me. Uh, bad mouth is where I had the premiere reading for my book um, in 2017. And it's where I hope to come back when we're all able to be back together. So um, it's with a tremendous amount of um, uh, gratitude that I am reading some poems. All of these poems are from my second collection, Hysterical, which will be published. <laughs> so make sure to you know, keep an eye out for that. I'm gonna read about six poems. Um, and I'd like to, um, I'm gonna start off by thanking the journals where these first appeared. Um, Adroit Journal, Gulf Coast, Swanee Review, and Quarterly West. Thank you to all of those editors. Black Thumb. The dogwood was threatening to swallow the back garden's light, so I borrowed a chainsaw and gas. Its last buries a memory of red, the fruit bitter, tiny angry mangoes in the mouth of its killer. Nights my son chooses his father to read him into silence. I practice not loving anything, less like learning than remembering. As a child, I studied how to be a child. I was given a doll to care for, but could never remember its name. I left her face down everywhere. She had her father's eyes. Each morning, she greeted me with a blankness I chose to know as forgiveness. There, there, I said, and slapped her back. There, there, I say to the tree trunk, its pale o's of accusal. From his bedroom window, my son eyes me, holding the humming saw. What I look like to him is a memory only he is born to bear. So some cheery ways to open. Um, I'm gonna read a couple poems that are part of uh, one of the projects of the book, which is, um, it sort of takes as its organizing principle, the Oristea, Oristea? I never say it right, apparently, although I'm like, who among us was alive in ancient Greece and can really correct my pronunciation. So, um, but the three play, right, um, epic that talks about the Trojan War. Um, and I really was led into it by thinking about women's fury and then thinking about the Furies, who are also called the Aranes, and thinking about women's anger um, and how we are made to we're punished for it, right? Um, and we're gaslighted when um, we believe that we have this, you know, this reason to be upset. So obviously more than that, but um, so I have a couple of poems that are part of this project. The first one is um, regarding Iphigenia. So the, the real quick story there, right? Agamemnon is part, like, part of the invading forces trying to 
go to battle with Troy. There's no wind. They can't sail their ships because Athena is pissed. So like, what can we do to appease Athena? A sacrifice. And Agamemnon is like, I know the perfect one, my daughter. Let's lure. So they lure Iphigenia in some versions um, under the belief that she will marry Achilles. So this is love song as Iphigenia in a teen movie asked to prom as part of a prank. Mornings I wake to see what body the night has made, praying the measuring tape to click out happiness's three spun locker code. Dear diary, I scrawl my lamentations in an alphabet of swirls, burn them at the altar of straight hair, of the moon loving this blood away. I was born and then I waited, bounced around like an asterisk in other people's stories. The pre-prom days an endless siege, eyeing the beach for some boy to break through. That bitch Helen, the school turned dogs for her, but still copying my math. My father hectors the football field, whistles swinging round his neck like a pendulum, counting down to something he thinks I can't understand. What I should have known I did not suspect, the invitation into my life into his, this boy gleaming from some god river inside him. That he knew my name meant happiness could learn it too. My mother brushing my hair, burnished like armor. Last minute, the dress, the clinging revelation. I leave my glasses off, scent my wrists and neck. The pinned corsage of ecstatic amaranth, tasseling my breast like my heart's own blooming. The crowd surrounds, they round their mouths in shock. Um, and forgive me, I'm doing that thing that we're getting accustomed to with so many Zoom events and videos, the sort of watching someone look at their screen and scrolling. Um, so now I have to find. I saw a TikTok impression of um, some teenager making fun of his professors and doing this was the whole impression. Okay, one second. Just looking up. Like, nailed it. This is my best friend's abuser takes her to court. A private eye serves her papers at work. Outside, it's all apples and gourds, hollow taunt. We stab the flesh until it grins. Our black wings unfurl and everyone asks what we are. Vengeance, I say. Justice, she corrects. He wants her to stop writing about the things he did, different than wanting to have not done them at all. We tongue our fangs in wedding, button up our lady suits. It is not possible to forget the face of a man who's made you the door to his urge. We were not children together, so now I braid her hair. It takes all night, the married strands lioning her like the male whose only job is murder. In court, he says he is the unnamed darkness she writes of. The women around him sob. Electra's mourning the man and not the sister he slew. He cries too, heaving in a gold button blazer, claiming his only crime was loving too much. The hand he raises, swearing, as if any god could help him now. I'm going to read a slightly longer poem. Um, because I like it and I never really get to read it because it is a little bit longer. Um, this is when I say Jesus was my boyfriend. <laughs> say it like it's all serious, but it came out of a, a joke I used to make all the time. You're like, oh, when, Je when Jesus was my boyfriend and I was at a, a writer's conference in 2017 at Swanee and uh, the writer well, I won't say her name, but <laughs> as a great writer, fiction writer, when I said that, I was like, oh, Jesus was my boyfriend when I was younger. And she's like, what do you mean when you say that? I was like, it's really, I really liked that call out um, to interrogate, investigate. What do I mean? When I say Jesus was my boyfriend, 
I don't mean that I snuck out my bedroom window, vaulting over juniper bushes to get to his car, which he'd bought by working summers and weekends at the Trujillo's mo broken moon ranch, tractoring the fields, hauling bales and turning a red so deep it gives up into brown. Nor do I mean he'd drive me through the early winter night to the lonesome mesa and turn off the engine sitting still for a nervous moment before leaning in to French my face, his eager tongue, a newborn calf struggling its way to milk, his hand searching my shirt and, when finding form, cupping my breast, less with lust so much as reverence, a jeweler staring through a loop at a gem rumored and finally realized, the radio playing an R&B song filled with harmonies and breakdowns and, at one point, talking, a testimony, the deep voice pledging to do better, be better, love harder, if given the chance. When I say Jesus was my boyfriend, I mean only that I talked about him to all my friends and did the things I thought he'd like because I knew he loved me, but mostly in the way we know at 15 that everyone we love will someday be dead, and we will be dead and an army flying some future flag will build an outpost on what was once the mall where our parents dropped us off to hang out with our friends, except that no one else shows. And so it's just us drinking an orange Julius and trying to look indifferent to loneliness, which is to say the certainty was theoretical and I wasn't sure of anything. So I gave my body to the river, wore white because I was his. When I say Jesus was my boyfriend, what I mean was that he told me he loved me, even though I didn't deserve it, that it was a gift I had to repay with my one stupid life, and that I should wait for him. And I did, and I am still waiting, not for him to descend from a sky in which clouds have formed the shape of a cross, which is a real dream I once had, him bursting golden in the blue over my church, my family and friends rising to meet him, first a few and then more, and I watched them go, and suddenly he went too. The cross of clouds collapsing into nothingness, and I was still there, still earthbound, untaken, and so this wasn't a dream so much as it was damnation. To have seen pure happiness come, but not for me. So I am not waiting for him, but for that feeling that someone would do anything for you feeling, would die a sandal-wearing virgin because it's him or you feeling. And I think maybe this is what has ruined me the most, that I want such love now, not in some rumored after and not from a ghost. And all I get is regular love, which doesn't even ask anymore how it is I like my eggs. And so maybe I don't deserve even this milk love its expiration date stamped along the seams, this love that makes listening sounds while staring off into a thicket of its own desires, only half in where it is and half where it wants yet to be. But why should love be any more resilient than the bodies we do this loving with? Why shouldn't love flab and crease, spot and sag, developing a weird but specific smell? And I keep wanting love to be kinder to me, but perhaps it is that I have not been kind to love. Not understanding, not patient enough to warm my own bed while love works nights in a factory that manufactures forgiveness, meeting the ceaseless demand, bringing the seconds home to me. I gave birth once and there was so much blood in the pain, I punched a wall, the fist mark left hanging like an angry moon. So I think it's no big deal to bleed for love. No miracle in being breakable. When I say Jesus was my boyfriend, I mean he died when the car he drove crossed over the solid line. That he's been married twice and has his real estate license. That he would look me up but has forgotten my last name. I mean, he said what he needed to say. I mean that some days when I see a group of girls tinged golden from chosenness, whisper curated confessions they release like doves into the air. I miss him. I miss him and do not tell my husband. Do not tell my friends. I carry the secret of missing him in my grown and tired body. 
until the world nudges a new horror forward, and I need the space he's in. I offer my good hands. I save what I can save. Okay, so um, two quick poems more. I feel like I'm going over time, but I'm also talking to a room where no one is, and so no one is here to stop me. Um, <laughs> so this poem uh, is called Civilization. You know that thing where you're someone's wife and you're out someplace with faces and suddenly you're shaking with the room's potential for kindness or cruelty while also finally understanding the tragedy of the dinner party, its reliance on food and talking and how they both have to happen with the same whole. And this is a joke, both the truth and the awareness of the truth and also humanness, how it happens just in one body for each of us. And there's no board to go to should you wish to dispute the results the where and when of this you. So you leave it to the bathroom when the flan is served and there is someone else's wife already there, smoking a cigarette she found in the host's son's room. And when you put your lips where her lips have been and inhale sharply the tar, you know she is barely in her body too, the heat of disappointment doing the deep valley of her philtrum. So what can you do but press your sweatered chest together? letting her heart murmur to yours its own meaty I am's, your twin drums announcing the coming war, the kind of war where you must shelter from yourself in someone else. So you lean in together, your Linnea nigras humming into the other, seeming you into one. And when you kiss each of her tears, you swallow the memory of their making, the quiet bed, the uterine collapse, the daughter whittled down to bone, and then her lips take you in, black birds moving in a churning field, and you know how as this is happening you make a choice, and how thinking gives it shape, a pearl your longing has made, you rolling it with your tongue against your expensed teeth so that the choice becomes a secret, and when a husband knocks on the door to see how one of you are, you separate, each wife holding in her mouth what she has seen, what she has chosen, and swallows. Um, my last poem is, um, so uh, sort of moving from the New Mexico of when Jesus was my boyfriend into when I was moving cross country. Um, and I found myself unexpectedly on a dirt road. I had taken a wrong turn and thought I was taking a shortcut back to the main. I was like, it was dusk and I was on this back road. I was like, it's fine. I'm just on this back road in Kansas. Like whatever, like what bad things ever happened? And uh oh, oh, it's like, oh yeah, that Truman, Truman Capote book. Um, so anyway, but before that, uh, thank you to Rebecca. Thank you to all the bad mouthers out there. I can't wait to see in person. Unmappable. Kansas coos me into its wheat. Done with direction, I follow the lightning. God's arrows insisting even the desolate can be a destination. In the black and white of a winter dawn, a train zippers the wet land to a sky clouded with intention. It looks more like a photograph than a photograph resembles the moment it captures. Its frame diverting, its filter slanting truths. Say I make of this a photo, what would the evidence show? That I was in a body here for a while and I wanted this to mean something? Is this the alibi or the crime? And who is the jury to receive this? No one knows I'm here. I loaded the car in Technicolor and drove east, had done milked the west of fresh starts, but the time changed, so I don't know when I am. Kansas says it does not matter. Time rolls over its husks and soil like fog, changing nothing. So much land. Anyone could be buried out here. Thanks. <laughs>